Okay, uh, well, welcome everybody. It's uh, Soundwalk September. Uh, it's a cafe and our guest is Cecilia Tyrell. Um, and I'm going to read her bio, which she's slightly embarrassed about because she can't remember what she wrote. Uh, <laughs> but I'm about to reveal it. So she writes, uh, my practice revolves around the physical experience of sound, exploring the environment around us and how we exist within it. I draw, up, uh, I draw upon notions of ecology and psychogeography to illuminate processes and systems that go unnoticed by the human experience, with a particular interest in examining how land around us can hold memory. I achieve this in a few ways, through sound walking and soundscape design, combining field recordings with found or imagined sounds to create new audio landscapes. These approaches place an emphasis on connecting history to local communities and uses sounds as a means of highlight systems of the natural world. Cecilia, did that sound like you? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that sounded about right. <laughs> yeah, do, you, do you want to add anything to that? Not yet. I think, well, I mean, the talk will, will hopefully illuminate no, The that talk will more, reveal it. Well, I... oh, well, hand over to you. You're going to take the stage. Okay. And, and, and what I just need to say to people is that occasionally I'll be putting a link in the chat. It was, uh, they were, the links were provided to you in an email, but I'll also be putting them in the chat. And what we'll ask you to do is put yourself on mute and listen to whatever the link is and then come back and uh, to join the discussion yeah okay okay i'll just uh share my screen and hopefully we can get going can everybody see that let's hope so great okay let's go <laughs> um well hi everyone thank you so much for being here this evening um i'm cecilia um i'm from london and i'm currently that's where i'm currently speaking to you from um today i'm just going to take you through some of my work um, I'm a new media artist focusing mainly on sound, but image also plays its part as well, mainly moving image um, using video um, as well as um, installation, so sound and video installation. Um, as I take you through this eve, I'll discuss concepts surrounding listening and the auditory field. Okay, so um, as we begin, I just wanted to share with you some central ideas uh, that sort of form the foundation of my practice. Um, the way I engage with art making extends also to the way that I want to exist within the world. It's quite a conscious decision, but I wanted to show you that I don't see a divide between my work and my life. Um, listening is something that extends beyond the auditory field, and I found that benefits the relationships with those around me. Um, so these are kind of ma the main words that I was thinking of when uh, trying to think of what to talk about for this talk. Um, <laughs> so to kind of think of them as a spider diagram, they exist on their own, but they also exist within community of each other. Um, walking is a big part, of course. Um, composition, listening is also a big thing. So movement, imagination and sound are sort of very key structures to what I then want to produce and share with the world. Um, yeah, so sound plays a central part, in the main part in, uh, in my work. I'm really drawn to how when engaging with sound, you also engage with your imagination. Um, and it extends upon this. I'm also drawn to the physical experience of sound and how much you can involve your body with this. Um, when I was little, I used to go to Saturday uh, music school. Um, and we had a class that was all about the physical experience of music, um, so moving with music, uh, not so much dancing. Um, it, you had to sort of, there was one exercise we had to do where all of us, there was about five or ten of us, um, and we all had to pretend to be an iceberg together uh, and then break away at our own accord. There was no prompts, we just had to do it whenever we wanted, so a group of seven-year-olds doing that was quite a funny experience. Um, this engagement of the body made a real impression on me and has become an important part of my process, whether that be for me when I'm out and about gathering material or for how the listener or viewer engages with the final piece. So, on that note, let me 
um, and just change a slide. Whoa. So that's going to bring us to the first piece I want to share with you, which is this is the cover image. Uh, it's called 4 4. Um, this was my first real experience, experimentation with um, using sound and image art making. Um, and it marked the culmination of my time uh, partaking, in, partaking in an art foundation back when I was about 19, which wasn't too long ago. Um, and I wanted to generate movement work that expressed movement. Um, I got quite sick of the traditional art practices such as uh, painting and sculpture. And I needed something that sort of shook this all up a little bit. So I thought video and sound was a really good place to start. Um, no one had really spoken to us about it on the course. Um, so with a bit of rebellious spirit, I decided to give it a go and see what I could make from it. Um, so I decided to take this idea of movement very literally um, and thought about it within my own immediate environment. So I ended up creating a piece that centered around my commute. Um, taking sounds that I'd encountered along the way, so that every day, you know, five, uh, yeah, five days a week, um, <laughs> that I probably overlooked, um, and try and make something, try and make something rhythmic out of it, um, and see how that relationship between sound and image could create something completely new, some some experience that you couldn't actually have whilst recreating the commute. Um, so. With that being said, I think it's time for our first link, please. <laughs> so uh, this is 4-4. Um, you should, it's not too long. I think it's maybe under five minutes. I can't actually remember. Um, but yeah, if you have headphones, that's great. If you don't, don't worry. Um, it can be, it's got a bit of flashing images. So just, just be warned about that. Um, but yeah, uh if you want to. And what duration are we watching all of it? If you want to, get get as far through as, as you feel like. Okay. <laughs> I all won't right. be offended if you don't, basically. The good thing about the um, funeral was that there were unrelated rhythms. The uh, Big Ben was chiming and the people were marching to the drumbeat and they were nothing to do. So that was bringing in synchronicity. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you thinking of using synchronicity as a component in your... Oh, I haven't, but maybe I should. You definitely um, should, yeah. Yeah, I, I love it when things like that happen naturally, you know. Um, obviously with what I just did it was very deliberate so yeah actually I, I was noticing things like that yesterday with the funeral and it was really dramatic wasn't it yeah and it, how it, they even with them I don't know what they were doing with the sound but you could tell that different bands were slightly playing at different times I don't and know the walking know. wasn't necessarily yeah. quite in, in step with the, the thing that's what gave it the, the power I thought yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah that's no, a good observation thank you Thank you, Robert. I really love the colours. I thought the colours were very Mondrian. Ah, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. underground. <laughs> yeah, the red and the blue and the yellow steps. I yeah. thought that was really clever. And obviously the rhythm. Um, I found it well, I found it difficult to focus. And this shows how the mind works, really. Yeah. It was hard to focus on the images which were very frenetic and the music which was also quite frenetic um, and I found it difficult to be able to focus on both of them at the same time it was like I was either listening to the music or looking at the pictures fully you know it was um so that was quite interesting um, as an experience yeah. Yeah, I, well, the, the colours, that's just from a GoPro. I didn't, I didn't decide to sort of make them look like that in a special way. But um, 
yeah i think also it's, it makes me think of if you have like a full score of music you can't read everything all at the same time um so i tried to use the screen as like something similar with thinking of it as a stave and how you can have so many things going on at the same time but actually you can't con con as you said you can't really concentrate on it all at, at once um but yeah thank you yeah, the other thing I was going to say is that I think you were actually um, videoing Mel in her yellow clogs walking down those stairs because <laughs> Mel actually has a pair of yellow clogs. So I just wondered if you... Uh... <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, but actually, I've, I found the watch really off-putting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure I actually, um, you know, that, that sort of... Uh, um, rapid far watch image was uh, drove me a bit nuts um <laughs> but you know <laughs> that that's that's what you artists get up to so never mind okay <laughs> on you go <laughs> i guess we're all yeah we're all time poor um with our commute so yeah okay great let's uh let's continue just a sort of conclusion from the piece i just showed you um some takeaways I had of, of, of the process. I just, I loved the process. I loved um, the idea of going on a journey, um, recording, and then going back to the studio, picking through everything and finding moments that really stood out to me. Mainly instinctual. I don't try and put too much thought behind things. It's usually what, what you know, what could catch my eye or catch my ear is what I would, would be drawn to, to using. Um, yeah, it, it, it sort of highlighted how certain sounds in your environment that you're used to every day can be overlooked um, and how we overlook the audio landscapes that we're part of, really. Um, and it began my thinking into um, ideas about hidden landscapes. So this takes us on to sound walking. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so hidden la landscapes, I sort of try and describe them as either frequencies or areas around us that are naked which we naked to our ears which we cannot audibly hear um, for example if you're stood by a river you you can hear the river you might be able to hear some wildlife or or signs of humans around you but um, you won't be able to hear what's going on inside the river or even next to you in the reeds that might be next to you um, so I wanted to I wanted to build um, a side of my practice that really supports this idea of unheard frequencies and hidden soundscapes alongside walking. Um, I wanted to maintain a physical engagement paired with curiosity. Um, this led me to develop a practice of sound walking, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, but for me personally, sound walking prompts the participants to listen and reflect to the environment around them noticing how topography and physical space shapes the sonic world which they are hearing. Um, so my first go at sound walking was on Hampstead Heath, great place, woohoo! Um, and I designed a sound walk based around this green space, Hampstead Heath, um, which is up in North London. The walk follows the natural incline from the overground station in the south all the way up to an open hilltop in the north. Along the walk, participants are prompted to listen and reflect on the shift in gradient and what this does to the sonic environment around them. So, I'm sorry, I, I have to exit the shared screen in order to change my slide. So I'm just going to do that quickly. So you can see what the sound walk looks like. So, this um, this was a prompt sheet that I designed uh, for participants. They don't have to use it, but um, I just wanted to give them things to think about, maybe like ways to move their bodies. I think when we when we go on a walk, sometimes we're quite strict to staying on the path. So trying to incorporate play into it, um, going off the path, engaging with maybe there's like you can notice different seasons. So if it's winter, if it's um, autumn time play with the leaves, that kind of thing. Um, and so on as a whole, you can, I'll leave you, to, you can have a little read for it if you want, if you can see it. But um, as a whole, these walks provided a time where I can step away from using electronics, gadgets, you know, tech, 
backpack related things that we're so used to in our daily lives now. Um, and also this need to always record and capture, just don't really don't like it. I think I wanted to have a part of my practice that really stripped everything back and was just about the body and just experiencing sound life around me. Um, so yeah, the three, the three holy grails of body, ears and imagination. Um, it acts as a time to gather ideas as well as reflecting with the participants. Um, and just keeping the approach simple, you know, I don't want to overcomplicate things. So it's a great time to sort of go out, experience, and then bring all those experiences back to the studio and come, come up with ideas. Um, so I hope you've had a little time to read through this, but don't worry if not. So the next piece that I'll introduce you to is called Siren's Dawn. Um, and you'll be able to realize that I'm drawn to using soundscapes and unheard frequencies by now within my works, keep going on about it. Um, and uh, this work, the work's origins um, began when I was walking around Dungeness um, and other sound mirror sites on the southeast coast of, of England. Um, um, I don't know if you're all familiar with what a sound mirror is, so I thought I'd just give you a, a little explanation in case you weren't. Um, a sound mirror, which is this, uh, also known as um, an acoustic mirror, is a passive concrete device used to reflect and focus sound waves. They were developed during World War II to detect approaching aircraft by listening for the frequency of a plane engine, which was detected by, by placing a microphone right in front of the sound mirror, which is probably they would have placed it about here. I imagine. Um, they're mainly found along the southeast coast of the UK um, and they're now largely neglected. Um, I was, when sort of walking around these spaces and experiencing from them for myself, the, the physicality of the object really stood out um, as well as uh, their sort of passive nature they have. Um, and they're now, as I said, disused. Um, and I, I was just very drawn to the landscape in which they're part of now as well. These sort of coastal spaces, cliffs, beach, marshlands, whatever you want to call them, um, they all share this tension between their identity of land and sea. Um, and this was something I really wanted to explore further within my work. So the piece itself um, is cannot be experienced as a, in a few different ways. It's either a soundscape or it can be experienced as a video uh, installation. It's a single screen video installation. Um, that's kind of how most of my projects turn out nowadays. They sort of have like different lives, um, but the sound part is always really important. Um, and it's usually the place that I start from the beginning and then the images come from the sound, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, like all projects, it started with sound and walking. Um, and taking in the objects and their physicality. Um, from there, I took recordings of what I was drawn to in these spaces. So some of the sounds I was thought about were sort of distant waves, you know, the classic sounds you think of when you go to the seaside or, or a beach. Um, so yeah, waves, uh, just general atmos of the space, um, trying to see if I could position myself in the mirror and if that could block sound in any way, what that would be like. Um, and also planes in the sky, that was really interesting, um, also because of what the sound mirrors used to be used for. Um, so these mirrors led me to think about sounds that are present, but which we cannot hear, um, that might be beyond our audible range. Um, and the soundscape I produced incorporates such sounds as well as audible sounds. So this includes recordings from the shipping forecast, um, which is daily for weather reports to vessels off the British Isles. Um, the language is English, but um, if any of you are familiar with it, it's, uh, it sounds like a different language, in my opinion, anyway. Um, I love it. It's very it's something quite relaxing about listening to it in the morning. Um, so, yeah, so I think Andrew's popped the link in the, in the chat. So this is an excerpt for, for Siren's Dawn. So the one you'll, you'll have get the link to is the, the video version, but this, this sounds there as well. 
Um, so yeah, I think it's about almost four minutes long. So um, yeah, come back when when you've watched it. Thanks. Yeah, I think Sarah, your your questions are really interesting. I think it's tricky. I I I mean, by using the sound mirrors, I feel like that I am engaging with them historically. But I I sort of see it as creating new spaces with them. I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, I try to stay away from uh, people usually with 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 work that I make, but um. Yeah, no, I'm I'm actually gonna I'm gonna think about those more, I think. I don't know if I can give you a succinct answer straight away, but they're really good questions, so thank you for them. Um I think also with sound walking, um, it makes me think a lot of like myths, uh, different myths that you can encounter and how they stay within landscapes. Um it's not something I've really read about a lot, but it's just sort of thoughts that occur when when walking in these spaces and, and trying to listen to things that aren't necessarily present straight away, that might be lurking in the landscape. Um, so thank you for your comments. Um, I'm just reading some more. Well, cool. yeah, Robert, good, good, good question. These are great questions, thank you. Um, I suppose I don't really see it as a soundtrack. Um, I kind, I think I want, I want people to walk away with questions. So it's good that you, you've got some questions about it. <laughs> um, they're not really. I don't see it there to serve anything necessarily. Um, I'm just going to read the second part. I think also um, sometimes when I think of installations, I think of like uh, oracles and things like that, creating spaces for people to think and potentially offload. Um, there's something quite powerful about being physically present within spaces like that. Um, I know there's a place down in Cornwall called St Necton's Glen, where people go and leave objects um, in this glen and I sometimes think of as installations working a little bit like that um, how you have to engage your body within them in order to receive or give um, so that yeah that's just a thought from from your questions um, I think that was Robert's questions um, should, I, should I try and answer all of these now or should I come back later I don't know how are we for time uh, it's entirely up to you. You can answer some of them now, or um, um, we, we may be able to get the person who asked the question to pitch in. It's, okay. uh, it's really how you feel. Uh, we, would you like Jack to, to ask the question? I don't know whether Jack can ask us his question. I think that's quite a pertinent one. They weren't, they weren't manipulated by the sound mirror. I was I was first interested in what it was and what it was used for, but I was mainly interested interested in the space that it was located in, um, because I would need a plane to have approached the sound mirror in order to use that kind of um, frequency. I think I don't know if that makes sense or if that's relevant to your question. Um, Mm, yeah, so they were they were recordings taken around the sound mirror, but not really in relation to the mirror itself. Um, I sort of was trying to think of ways to how to engage the sound mirror in the recordings, but the only way I could do that really was by using it as a way to block 
um, the sound of the road behind me. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to incorporate sounds that were necessary to the mirror. So things like um, planes, like there's a plane in the piece itself. Um, just trying to think about the environment around it and what could exist there along with the mirror itself. I don't know if that helps in any way, but um, yeah, that's just a quick, quick thoughts from the question. Um, okay, great. Thank, thanks, Jack. <laughs> um, okay, I think we should maybe move on to the next to the next piece, which I will just get up for you. So. Um, so this is, uh, moving on to the next one, um, uh, this is um, Frise, which I'm really sorry, I don't have a very good Icelandic accent, um, but this is an island off the north of Iceland, which um, I spent January on, um, which is relevant to the piece that I will show you next, um, which is called Upon the Shore. So I've shown you work that embraces time outside, listening and walking, which then culminates in video and audio artwork. Um, but recently, in six minutes past nine, it's the name of, um, of the company or art, artist collective, um, they did an online art re residency and they approached me to be part of it along with three other people. We were provided with an online space through a website called New Art City, which is kind of used for cu curators. And I think it was actually born out of the pandemic when we couldn't have physical um, exhibitions. So you could create online exhibitions through this website. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but um, it's worth having a look in case you are. Um, and so we were given a space on New Art City to create for ourselves. Um, they styled it as a studio, but um, within the, the confines of the technology, you can make it look whatever you want it to be. If you want it to set it in outer space, you can make it look like outer space. So you can do whatever you want with it, which um, was quite daunting at the beginning because I'm not big with um, that kind of realm of Earth 3D work and, and such. Um, so yeah, they, they just said, fill it with what you want, experiment. Um, there's no sort of set criteria so this was a new experience for me as most of my work revolves around site and location so this idea of um, replicating somewhere that already exists on an in an online environment was um, didn't sit very well with me um, i'm all about being outside and experiencing it in real life so the online world can be a bit daunting in that sense um, so instead i decided to build a space that placed an emphasis on listening um, combined in, combining soundscape design and uh, video tableau like windows, um, which I'll show you a little bit more about in a minute. Um, so as you, the viewer, if you were to log on and uh, go around the site, you use your arrow keys on your, on your uh, computer. It's a bit like if you're in a computer game and you actually fly. So there's no walking, which is quite cool because you can't do that in real life. So you fly around the space um, and the audio is located at different points. So as you move, the audio soundscape that you're listening to changes. Um, so, yeah, um, as you move, you hear different sonic spaces. Um, some of them are subterranean. Some of them are upon the shore, so by the beach um, and others are up in the sky. So you could feel like you're in the clouds. Um, this space itself is based on this island, which you can see on your screen. Um, this is Frise, there's about 200 inhabitants there. Um, it's a little island in a fjord in the north of Island, Iceland. Sorry. Um, this mountain here was very dominant in the landscape um, and the sun itself kind of would rise and set around it. They had a really lovely, I felt like symbiotic relationship, but to be to be decided um, and yeah I spent a month up there um, taking recordings walking observing the landscape um, 
so this experience on in the online world is sort of a culmination of all of that still trying to decide whether I, whether I'm happy with it whether I'm happy with it existing online um, but yeah I have a screen recording of a walkthrough in case um, it can be a bit confusing actually going on the site if you're not familiar with using these sort of like online video exhibitions. I don't know if Andrew, if, um, if it's worth me uh, taking people through it or whether it's easier to watch the walkthrough. But I can give you both, we can give you both links in case. Yeah, I've put it, I put both links in the chat. Yeah, uh, Cecilia, should we look, watch the video first, the Vimeo upon the shore walkthrough? Is that a yeah. long video? No, it's for, it's quite short. I think it's maybe three minutes. Um, well, if we, yeah, if we watch that and then see if people want to try the, uh, yeah, the, the 3D site or the digital site. Just a quick um, note that, um, it's a, a screen recording of my own screen and my laptop's very slow so it will look quite uh, jittery i don't know if that's the right word it, if you go on the site it's a lot smoother um but i just wanted to give that a heads up <laughs> um but yeah go for it uh watch the walkthrough and then um yeah come come back afterwards yeah yeah why don't we watch the walkthrough come back and then have a vote on whether we're gonna play around in the in the digital space that sounds great. See you in a bit. That's just to sort of give you an idea of the space. Um, I'm still quite undecided about um, online installation spaces. I think they can be quite hard to navigate, especially if you're not familiar with computers or how they work. Um, you also generally need to have quite a powerful computer, even mine, which is like quite a competent MacBook, struggles sometimes walking, walking around these spaces. Um, but yeah, uh, I tried to keep it as simple as I could with this. Um, just well, I'm not really familiar myself with creating a lot of 3D generated objects and such. So um, as I said before, simplicity is key for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so th that's pretty much the, the presentation. Um, it's just a sort of a window into what I make um, and some just some thinking around it. Um, I don't really surround myself with a whole lot of theory. Um, much of what I do and record is based on instinct and just pure preference, really. Um, but I do admire the work of Pauline Oliveros. Um, her deep listening is something that I'm really drawn to and, and I'm actually taking a course in it at the moment. Um, but yeah, above all, I just hope that my work is accessible to anyone um, who wants to engage with it. And so on that note, thank you very much for listening. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Yeah, well, great. Let um, I, I, um, everyone unmute themselves and let's have a let's have a chat about some of the stuff. Um, uh, uh, Bob, I, when you say the 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 sound of the waves and linking the sound to visuals, immediately the sort of visuals came on. It was almost as though I was enhancing the what I was hearing, even though. Uh, but I I really enjoyed how you, how one could move around the space. I was really surprised. I didn't think I was going to uh, be taken with it at all, but I thought it was very. <laughs> I thought it was very good. Is that? But is that what one would call three D audio, or is it only the audio? Um, is actually not three D, is uh, it? You know? It's not. It's yeah. It's it's not in the sense of I guess binaural audio, which you know you that's everywhere, isn't it? You can kind of hear it behind you and such. It's more when designing the space, you can. Um, you can sort of place it around so as you as you walk as you as you move towards something it will get louder um, 
and likewise if you move away it will get quieter but it's it's still stereo sound in that in that sense yeah yeah. Far away, Bob, yeah. Yeah, okay. Just as an example, uh, the Dutch in the Renaissance used an intuitive um, uh, approach to uh, perceiving space. And then in the later Renaissance, the Italians came up with a theory, Alberta's theory of uh, perspective, and that they could chart and accurately mark space within the picture plane. Is there something comparable? I know you're working on an intuitive level, and this is my own theory. With form, I see Rodin, um, um, Michelangelo as intuitively feeling around form, but whereas with Cambodian art, there's, I won't go into the theory now, there's a conscious link between one, two and three dimensions. Now, can you see how there could be developed a theory? I know, I realize because it's a new, science and I really want to know what sound art is but assuming that um, a new science or a new art could you see that there could be a theory that, that takes it further or beyond just empathy if you like is there is there something that, that, that would um, give us something d definitive to you know as, as a tool I hope so I don't know if I no ideas yeah <laughs> I loved your question of what is sound art because my granny asked me this the other day and I was really flummoxed. What is it? <laughs> I don't know how to answer her. Oh. I was like, um, audio, audio landscapes. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'd be interested to hear more. I don't know if anyone's written about it or, or that's been discussed in any way, but I, I haven't heard anything from what you, you're talking about, um, anything more. So yeah, I, I'd be curious to know. I don't know. I can't answer that, but yeah, I'd like to know. <laughs> Anybody know? <laughs> no. It's a general question. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to pitch in with anything or we could go back and look at uh, some of the other things that we talked about well what i was quite surprised about i think with the icelandic one was uh i, I always understand that iceland is so windy it's in, it's actually pretty nigh impossible to do any recordings at all yeah um, i think i was quite naive when i went um I, stupidly it did, just didn't cross my mind until I got there um, and then realised that yeah windiest place I've ever been and in January which probably made it 10 times worse but uh, it was good to have that challenge I think um, and actually there were some really it made you really pay attention to these sort of uh, not the best description but these smaller sounds that happen in very very small located areas that you could find if it was still windy. Um, so things like the sound of ice melting or sometimes you get these like under under the snow, these like streams would form. So recording through the snow and hearing the streams, um, that was quite interesting. And the ptarmigan, there was a huge ptarmigan population there. So hearing that through through the landscape, um, there were there were there was many moments of of, of quietude within this very like noisy place, which was quite curious. I wasn't expecting that. So that was a really nice observation. Uh, and maybe, maybe I can keep asking questions. I've got lots of questions to ask, but yeah. what about other people? I mean, well, one of the things, sorry, when, when you're recording the sound of the water, are you using hydrophone microphones or? Yeah, so um, there's a har there was a harbor there um, and you might, yeah, I don't know. I think for me, being an outsider, you think, oh, go to the north of Iceland. You're never going to come across any sounds of engines or planes or anything. But actually, this, the harbour runs like you get, a, you have a ferry, a 15 minute ferry to the mainland, like every 20 minutes. So the engine's running all day and you can hear it wherever you are. Um, so, yeah, that was quite fun to play with, um, both with hydrophones and also with just like my Zoom, which I was using to record most, most of what was going on. Um, and then, yeah, once you get back to edit, get into editing, you can really draw out those really like weird subterranean sounds underwater. I wonder what all the seals make of it, but um, 
yeah that was fun you quote uh, psychogeography how does psychogeography relate to your practice i think like i I'm, I'm not i haven't done a lot of research into it but it's just from discussions with with friends and and fellow art makers i suppose um thinking about how land holds memory um even i think i've been reading a lot about um like uh, uh, industry changing over the past uh, 100 years, especially with farming um, and how that's changing the land. But I think there's still this idea of memory that's still located in the land. Um, so it's more, I don't know, it doesn't really come across in my work, but it's just some thinking that I do whilst I'm out in the landscape, thinking about how the space has changed, how the visual space has changed, uh, what could have been there before um, why we make it want to look the way that it is, that kind of thing. So I don't know if that is psychogeography, but that's just... Sounds it. like it, but how, how, I'm just wondering how you could use that deliberately. Yeah, be... no, it's a good, it's a good point. Um, it, so to say, because, you know, it's mysterious, this whole thing about yeah. the changing, you know, the history of a place and yeah. it's changing geomorph morphology rather, isn't it? It's the changing morphology and how that's related to human interaction. And there must be some sort of... Um, um. I think also that I think that's with with thinking of it through a sound perspective where that could kind of be quite interesting um, for future projects sort of playing into how, the how would you how would you uh, record the sound of uh, the landscape or just like the sound the wind makes or the sound that people make when walking on it or is there something that does are there vibrations in mass you know in, yeah in mass, do they have uh, you know do they have a, a resonance that you could pick up with certain instruments yeah well these are great questions this is it yeah, do they? i don't know <laughs> you don't know okay yeah how best do you do how do you how do you put that into an audible range you know like all these thoughts and ideas that you want to express but you want to express the audio like how do you do that i yeah. don't know <laughs> the criticism of david hockney is that he used photographs which you know, half of what art is about is perceived space, the struggle to represent space. Yeah. So yeah. if you're just taking it and then copying the photograph or whatever, or developing, it's a similar thing with sound. If you just take sound, rather than try to understand what underpins it or what produces it, it's it's not so interesting. You know, it's not, it, it's cut, it's, it, in a sense, it's, perhaps it is a fine art at that stage. It's more craft. I'm not I sure. Think, well, I think there's, I find with sound, yeah, thinking about what the origin of that sound, what's generating that sound, or what's reacting to that sound is interesting. And I think I quite like the idea of not always knowing, and then your mind has to try and work out what's going on. The imagination that that requires, I find really interesting. And I try and hopefully put that into the work in some way. Um, you this, mean like a haunted space or something like that? So you give it an error. Like, you know, when you watch a film, oh, this is a bit gruesome, but like if someone gets stabbed and, yeah. you know, someone hasn't literally got stabbed for them to get that sound, someone's probably like punched a watermelon or something. Like yeah. it's, I find that sort of weird thing that's happening. Um, kind well, of. Night shells for horses. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's just on like a, 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 like a simple level, but. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of cool and how you can more imagination, more playful elements. I think that's what I want to try and generate with what I'm making in a way. Um, well, I, I was interested, too, because I, do you think when you're kind of working on on making recordings, uh, are you drawn to the of the unheard frequencies? Are you drawn to higher frequencies or are you drawn to lower frequencies i mean your commute were lower frequencies yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and and yet a lot of what uh you know perhaps even around the sound mirrors you could you could have been working on much higher frequencies uh, especially when you you think about water mm -hmm. you know you need higher frequencies to to get over the sound of the white noise of the water so yeah i'm just yeah. interested are you drawn to lower frequency sounds or I think it changes. It really does. I, I think when I was doing the Sirens Dawn project, I feel like it was a lot higher. And then sometimes, so, and then moving on to the, upon the shore, having the hydrophone 
opened up this whole world of lower frequency that I just didn't know was there, <laughs> um, which is kind of the beauty of it, really. Um, and yeah, so I, I think it's it's again like just going out recording, see what happens, and then come back and see what you're drawn to. Because I think yeah, I've, I wouldn't have ever realized that unless I'd had a hydrophone and been able to find those lower frequencies really. But it changes. It changes a lot. It depends on. I guess it depends on my mood as well. Do you want us? You know, do, do, <laughs> do you want it to sound all grumpy or do you want it to sound all like? There's fairies in there or something. <laughs> the breakdown. Mel, uh, the breakdown uh, uh, of, sorry. Um, I was just going to say Mel wanted to jump in, so uh, just good. Oh hi, yeah no, Cecilia. I'm just really interested in what the response was, the Icelandic piece of the people who live in the area and how they responded to what you, um, to, to your response to what is very familiar to them. Yeah, I well, I haven't actually been able to send it to them because it's only it's come out the past two weeks. But I've I've sent a link to the people who are in charge of the residency, but they don't actually live on the island. So, yeah, I they, I wish I could tell you, but I don't know. Um, I'd be yeah, I'd love to know though. I've I did a sound walk for that for 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 Iceland as well, and that was interesting hearing feedback from that because they lived there um but they yeah they were lovely people so kind mm. um yeah but I'll, if i find out i'll let you know <laughs> yeah because i i often think that we kind of become the environment that we live in you know we um and so i'm quite intrigued you know by a place that's so different to our experience of living in london yeah um what the people are like and how they have been kind of molded by that environment yeah. yeah and such a striking environment as well like it's such a remarkable place to live um I, you can't like for me i couldn't believe that this is where people would call home that was extraordinary in its own right but yeah if i find out i'll let you know thank you <laughs> Sorry, Bob, I cut you off, but I also okay. noticed that Jack made a brief appearance there and disappeared. But so, Bob, do you want to uh, yeah, say something more? Down. With the breakdown of sound uh, it, it, in different frequencies, whereas the breakdown of light is in the spectrum, I'm not a physicist, but what's the link between sound waves and light waves, or is there a link? So you can, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> when you're dealing with space, actual space, you've got two, you've got light, yeah, and you've got, um, well, you've got sound, they're two components. Um, oh, that's all oh, okay. No, I, I, I don't know. These are great, though. I love them. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, throw these, you throw these things, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. What you're, you're and, yeah. Well, I, I went on earlier. I just carry on. This is, just shut me up. Um, I know the link between mass in terms of sculpture is identifying the center of gravity. I'm just wondering what uh, mass is in terms of uh, light and sound. There's another one. <laughs> You've got three there. Mass, light, and sound. They, they comprise. Um, That's brilliant. Space, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> Okay, have we got any other questions or comments that anyone wants to make? Uh, yeah, sorry, I can speak my question if you can hear me okay. Yeah, brilliant, Jack, we can. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I guess, um, yeah, it's going to be that typical thing. It's not really a question, more of a sort of comment thing. But um, yeah, I, I was interested. So if you compared like 4-4 uh, four, four to, the, uh, well, yeah, to the, to the final work that we looked at, and, and just the difference between them in the sense that like for four the sound was very sort of manipulated into a particular rhythm whereas the, the final piece it seemed yeah. to be i mean i imagine there might have been some like noise reduction and a bit of editing but like it seemed to be mostly just you know the sound that was recorded and yeah i guess i'm just interested in your perspective on um in terms of your practice and what you're trying to convey through your work um yeah between that sort of level of manipulation to achieve something versus you know just the pure sound that you record in the field yeah that's 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's a balance, I find. I don't want it to be one or the other, really. I think um, when it when I find it most interesting, it's having both. Um, and actually, the last uh, Upon the Shore, whilst it might sound like that's what it was like, it, that there is quite a lot of editing involved in it to make it sound like that. But that's also intentional. Um, I lo And... I guess it goes with trying to uncover these like lower frequencies or higher frequencies that are beyond our audible range. If you can enhance them, then they're kind of there, really. Um, so yeah, that that happened a lot with um, the hydrophone, like trying to really draw on the sort of very low, uh, what would you call it, almost like heartbeat feel of the engines and things. but. Um, I, I'm I'm all for manipulating sound. I think it's it's fine as long as it serves a purpose. Um, uh, if it's, I just want it to be there. The purpose for me is to make it as immersive as possible. Um, so that's kind of the way that I think about it when editing. If it doesn't serve that purpose, then I shouldn't really be using it. And I think the more manipulative manipulated it gets for me, it then becomes becomes like music. Um, which isn't really something that I want. Uh, so yeah, I like a bit of both. I tend I tend to have one track which is like the Atmos, and then everything else can do what it wants. It might be mixed, as long as there's Atmos, things kind of tend to stay a bit more balanced. Yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting. That's, I don't know if that. Yeah, no, that really is interesting. It's interesting you made the comparison with music as well, because there's obviously aspects of both sound art and music that sort of, well, there's, there's like a grey area, like in terms of like lo-fi music, for instance, yeah. or ambient music, where, you know, Atmos is like a central component, versus, mm -hmm. and like sound art where there's very like rhythmic, for example. Yeah, I think it goes off what Bob was saying, like, what's the, can you think about the origin of where that sound's coming from? If it's so manipulated that it's you have absolutely you have your imagination can't even engage with it, then that's where I know that I've gone too far. As long as there's some kind of hint as to where this could be coming from, some sort of space that it could be located in, then that's when I feel like I'm doing a okay job with it. But once it steps over that threshold where it's you, you just have no idea, that's when I start to think this is more like music than, than sound art. So yeah. Really interesting perspective, thank you. Well, thanks for your question. No, I mean, that's something else that I find, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're manipulating the higher frequency sounds that normally humans can't hear and you're trying to bring it down to a, to a sound that a human can hear, yeah. then can the human actually imagine that space? Well, yeah. they don't, but, but in a strange way, they don't need to because all these spaces that we in, inhabit have sounds we can't hear. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, there, there, there is a sort of soundscape to them anyway. And, yeah. and, and the point is we don't have to imagine. Uh, so in a sort of strange sort of way, you know, you have this sort of kind of, I don't know, conflict almost where you, you almost have to listen to something but almost ignore it. Uh, ignore your imagination and just go by what you see and feel. I don't know. It's I. It, it's it's quite it's quite difficult. I've I've worked a lot with um, people who use you know who record ambient soundscapes, and they use a lot of microphones. Mm. And so you know they're they're probably recording with you know uh, certainly with four or eight, and sometimes as many as fifty linked microphones. Uh, you know, to to gather this, um, um, you know, uh, soundscapes, um, and and I could I sort of kind of lose, uh, you know, I, I lose it. That they're, they're so immersed in what they're doing and so clued up, they kind of can remember all the things they've recorded, even though they've recorded them from dozens of uh, or at least you know many microphones. When when you were making, for example, your pieces in for. Is it pronounced hearsay? I don't know how you pronounce it, but yeah. somewhere in Iceland. How 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 did you keep a note of what you'd recorded? Do you do you, do you sort of um, 
do you have a little notebook or do you, do you, do you just remember oh i record it and that's mm, you know. right. <laughs> yeah i think there's always going to be sounds that you will remember um you know those sort of un, unexpected unexpected moments that will occur um but yeah it's usually from what i've recorded i each i'll rename each file according to like the prominent things that happen um so that helps to kind of keep a track because otherwise it's just a lot of like zoom zero zero one two five and like that means nothing um yeah and it depends like i might take notes if if something's really um if there's a thought whilst walking or, or such um but yeah it's usually just i think the, the ones that really stick out you, you you do remember you know within all of the i don't know you, you might be recording for like an hour and you might get nothing so <laughs> it just depends one, one thing that you might be interested in what brought me into sound in the 68 <laughs> was the uh with the old vedic the vedic scriptures the indian yeah um, that sound atoms comprise form on an electron level. So in a mantra, you can go into a tantric trance and recreate form through sound. So that actually, theoretically, is a direct link between the two. That might be worthwhile exploring. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm looking at that. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, well, Mel, you, you could probably talk about um, sound mantras and... Um... So, but you may not want to talk about it. <laughs> but, but, but Mel being a meditation instructor, her meditation is based around a sound, isn't it? So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I have a I have a mantra that I in for my meditation practice. You know, which is a um, sounds that I repeat over and over um, to, to to help me get into a meditation. But when I was um, studying, um, we, it was fascinating because we looked at the Sanskrit language, which is a language which is created from vibration, um, from sound. And, um, you know, to, and, and this idea in the Vedanta is that consciousness came into being because consciousness wanted to have an experience and it wanted to experience itself. And it did that by rubbing and it was the rubbing that was the sound so this idea that everything came from sound um sound is is the essence of everything that we are yeah. is um it, it's mind-blowing really but yeah. um can, really... I add to that? can i add to that yes my, yeah, my please only, do. My yeah. only experiences with Khmer sculpture is uh I won't tell you the whole story behind it, but essentially I experimented with hearing, not seeing sound. So I tried to hear what I saw and I spent 10 or 15 years hearing what I smell, hearing what I taste, hearing what I touch. I use that as the dominant way and it started to move between dimensions. It started to move between one, two and three dimensions. I can say a lot more, but that, that's, that was back in the 60s that I was exploring. Brilliant. That sounds like you need quite a lot of drugs, Bob, to kind of oh, experience I'm going to take that. A drug in my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's um, it is fascinating. I mean, I'm I'm truly fascinated by sound and the frequency of sound. And, I mean, not just all frequencies. You know, everything around oh. us and how that. The, because as well as meditation, I'm also a homeopath, which basically is all about, you, you know, diluting a frequency of something, it could be anything, and finding an individual's frequency, and then you match like with like, which comes from Paracelsus, you know, the law of, the law of similars, and, Paracel you know, I'm, say that again, the law of so this, like, the, the, the law is similar, so like begets like. So if you have a vibration, a frequency, and you meet something that has the same essence, the same frequency, it will create a reaction within you that will be that of healing and bliss. It would be a sort of spiritual coming, a spiritual awakening. 
when you say the same frequency, are you talking about within that media, i.e. the frequency of light, or could it be a, a different frequency, say the it, frequency it could of be, sound? Yeah, it could be a different frequency. Well, that's brilliant. I want to hear yeah. a little more about that. <laughs> it's just a, an ecstatic reaction. Yeah, it, well, we all, we're all vibrating at a frequency. We are just energy and vibration. And so when we, it's like we're just, I don't know, molecules bouncing around, you know, yes. with lots and lots of millions, billions, trillions of other frequencies. Yes. And you come across frequencies that resonate and you come across frequencies that don't resonate. Mm. And when you find frequencies that resonate very deeply with you, that's when you get a very profound reaction to could you, could you call that, that a spiritual reaction? I mean, yes, yeah, yes. Oh, cool. yeah. Gosh, I, I'm terrified of using that word because you got lamb blasted when in the sixties, but it's becoming more widely used now, isn't it? As, yes, as a, yeah. I think expensive. we're, be, we're I think we're much more relaxed with talking about these sort of things um, than we may have been, you know, even twenty years ago. I think we we've, we've moved. But the frequency of the universe is, is changing so quickly, you know, everything's speeding up, everything's quickening. And within that, our awareness and our openness to these things is also expanding. Mm. There's also the physics theory that power equals energy over time, I think. Uh-huh. And uh, power is, 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 is fueled by force. Yes. Energy is fueled by human enthusiasm. It's yes. It's a really thing, um, comparison between the two. Mm. Yeah. Just to say, Jack, I don't know, Jack, can you tell us a bit more about Lefebvre's rhythm analysis or his polyrhythmia? Because I have to be honest, I don't know about that. Um, no, it's just the discussion about um, different frequencies that exist um, just in life. Uh, he his um, book is a really short book called Rhythm Analysis. He he discusses so Lefebvre is like a sort of urban theorist. He's discussed a lot in geography, and um, yeah, he uh, in this book he sort of talks about um, city life and the different rhythms of city life through this notion of polyrhythmia and the idea that there are some frequencies like that are eurythmic, so that they um, they sort of resonate or, you know, their rhythms uh, in like urban life, for instance, that work together. And then there's like arrhythmia, so uh, rhythms that are somehow like disjo disjointed in some way um, or conflicting. Um, and yeah, he, he just discusses urban life through this lens of like polyrhythmia. And that was very sort of, um, what's the word? Like, uh, that was quite a new idea at the time when mm. he came up with that theory. Um, and it's still only sort of being explored like in geography now for instance but um but yeah it's just an interesting perspective i hadn't really thought about it through the lens of like sound art or uh, walking arts but yeah it's yeah it might be an interesting reference point for people yeah. Thank you. otherwise i think what we might do is invite cecilia to have the last word what <laughs> <laughs> say thanks thank you for this great discussion i feel like i've got i've made a lot of notes and uh yeah it's just been really nice to spend the past hour and a half with you all thank you <laughs>